Hello and welcome to Math for Honors at Arlington High School. My name is Kirk Weiler and today I'm going to be talking to you about how we can use the website program Desmos in order to graph parametric equations. Now, parametric equations typically show up in a pre-calculus class for the first time. So if you're taking Common Core Algebra 2 or Common Core Algebra 1, this could be kind of cool for you, but you may not know the content. And right now, I'm talking as somebody who has taught parametric equations to my students already. So you have to have a little bit of background in parametric equations. All right, so let's begin to figure out how to graph parametric equations on Desmos. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by graphing a line. All right. And if you remember from parametric work that we've done, lines generally have equations that look something like this. I'm going to graph the line y equals negative 8 plus 3t and y equals 3 minus 2t for a domain interval, let's say 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 4. Now remember, for students that were in my class, this means that we've got some line that goes through the point negative 8 comma 3, and it has a slope of negative 2 thirds. And again, why that is, we developed in class. So let's take a look at how we graph this on Desmos. We're going to graph it very similar to the way that we try to graph a coordinate point. In fact, I'm going to start by putting in a parenthesis. And I'm going to type in the equation for x, negative 8 plus 3t. Now notice it's asking me to put a slider in for t. Don't do it. Just put a comma, and that slider piece is gone. Now I'm going to put in 3 minus 2t for y. And notice down here my domain for t has already showed up, and of course my domain is 0 to 4, and there's my line. Now this is significantly different from the way a calculator like the Texas Instruments would graph it, because it would actually show the line graphing as t went from 0 to 4. That's not the way Desmos looks at it. Desmos looks at it as just you are going to graph a series of points between 0 and 4 in terms of t and all those points are going to have this form negative 8 plus 3t, 3, 3 minus 2t. One of the real disadvantages here is that we don't know where this thing started, we don't know where it stopped, we don't get any sense of the motion. So I'm going to show you how to deal with that right now, and this is kind of cool. If I go up to the settings icon, or the edit list icon up here, and I click on it, one of the options is right here, it's duplicate, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate that. No, not, no great surprise, nothing else came up on the screen right now. On the other hand, if I now go in and edit this, and I replace T with the letter A, notice now the slider didn't go away. So I'm going to add a slider for A, and I'm going to make its domain interval exactly the interval I did for T. Now what does Desmos think right now? now I'm going to change this to a different color. It thinks I'm asking it to graph a point, a point that has the coordinate negative 8 plus 3A and 3 minus 2T, and at least for right now, A is equal to 0. So we're at the point negative 8 comma 3. If I hit play, then what I see is that point is going down. Of course, then it goes back up. Let me pause just for a minute. This icon right here on Desmos tells it whether when it gets to the end of a slider, it should just go kind of on a loop, or whether it should always begin from the beginning. If I click this, now it will always begin from A equals zero. And I can see the motion of what's going on now. I'm starting up here, and I'm ending down here. And it's kind of a sly little workaround, this idea that this really is the path. Maybe I'll put it in dashed. That's the path. But this is actually the motion, if this line represents motion at all. Okay? So it's pretty easy, and I'm going to do a bunch of other examples, including parametric equations. So what I'm going to do right now Let's clear this out, this out, and this out. And I'm also going to clear out the text. Let's do another one. Okay. Let's go with a parabola, or at least something that kind of looks like a parabola. One of the initial one of the initial curves I did with my students in class was this one. 
x equals t squared and y equals 2t. And we did it specifically for an interval negative 2 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 4. Again, it's pretty easy to put this into Desmos. All I'm going to do is put in t squared as my sort of x parameterization, 2t is my y. Now again, the default is always 0 to 1. I want to change that negative 2 to 4. And now maybe I'll just kind of drag it down so that I can see that entire thing. Ah, there it is, a little bit better. Get it out of that text. Now again, one of the things about this curve is it definitely represents every single point that is sort of on the path of motion. Let me put it in red dash. All right, but if I actually want to see where the curve starts, where the curve ends, and what the motion looks like, I can put in the exact same thing with anything but t. I just can't use t. t is reserved for time, if you will. And I add my slider. I make it go from negative 2 to 4. Bring it all the way back. And there's my motion. I don't even need the dashed curve there. Let me go like that. This thing will then follow that path even when I can't see it. I kind of like being able to see the path. It's sort of fun, right? It gives me a sense for where the point is going as it moves along this parametric path. But again, very, very simple, right? One of these things gives me the path. The other one, if you will, shows me where the point is for any time t. Of course, A is representing time here, which is a little weird. Let's do one that gets into a conic section. Let's do an ellipse. All right, let me kind of bring the screen back like this. And why don't we do an ellipse? And what should we do? Let's say, Let's go with an ellipse that's got a radius, if you will, of 10 in the x direction, and another radius of, let's go 7 in the y direction. Right, we don't want to make them the same, otherwise it'll be a circle. Now, in order to get a full ellipse, we're going to want our t to go from 0 to 2 pi. And something funny is going to happen on this that I think is important to take a look at. The curve's going to run into this type, but don't worry about that. We'll, we'll move it eventually. All right, let's put that thing in. 10 times the cosine of t, comma 7 times the sine of t. All right, now it would be lovely if I could go in here and put in 2 pi. And one almost thinks I can, because here down where I've got the Desmos keyboard, it seems like I should be able to type a pi in right now. But do you notice what happened? The cursor suddenly went up here. Desmos will not let me put a pi in here. So we have to sort of do it the old fashioned way. Pi is 3.14, so 2 pi is about 6.28. And there's my ellipse. There it is. Now again, what's kind of disturbing about this is that I don't really know where the ellipse begins, where the ellipse ends, whether or not the object goes around this path in a clockwise manner or a counterclockwise manner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that same trick I did before, 10 times the cosine of a, 7 times the sine of a, and I'll add a slider for a. Just like before, Desmos won't allow me to use that keyboard to put a 2 pi in here, so I'll just do 6.28. Pull it all the way back and play. By the way, notice, you know, when we hit the end, it started going clockwise, but that's again because of the Desmos animation. I have the thing sort of going forwards, then backwards. But if I always have it going in the forwards direction, it'll look like it's just going to endless, endlessly go around that ellipse. Again, this is kind of important because, yeah, the path that the particle is moving on is an important thing when you talk about parametric equation work. But as well, it kind of matters where you start, where you stop, things like that. And remember, if I go in and let's say I negate the 10, I'm going to negate the 10 here as well, notice that that's, the path didn't change at all. That's the exact same ellipse I had before. But now 
I'm starting at negative 10 and I'm going clockwise around this ellipse. All right? The thing about ellipses is that they have to have a cosine here, they have to have a sine here. Well, that's not true. They have to have a cosine, they have to have a sine, but they can be in either location. In fact, if I change this to sine and this to cosine and this to sine and this to cosine, again, notice my ellipse didn't change at all. But where it starts, it did. It now starts at the top of the ellipse. Travels counterclockwise, but it starts at the top of the ellipse. We can make it travel even in a different direction by getting rid of these negatives. Still the same path, right? But now, where is it starting? It's starting at the top and going clockwise instead. All right, so that's an ellipse. <coughs> when I started parametric work with my classes, the first thing that I did is I did some projectile motion work with them. And that's where we're going to kind of end up today. So originally, what I did with my students is I had them do the following projectile motion problem. Okay, This was the parameterization. I had x equals, and what was it? It was 40 times the cosine of 60 degrees times t. Notice that the t is out here. It's not inside of there and y equals negative 16.1 t squared plus 40 sine of 60 degrees t plus 10. And this was a projectile that was fired at an initial angle of 60 degrees with an initial velocity of 40 feet per second and an initial y height of 10 feet. This is just one half of the acceleration due to gravity in the English system. Anyway, let's throw this thing in. All right. We've got 40 times the cosine of 60, uh, 60 times t, comma, negative 16.1 t squared, plus 40 times the sine of 60, T plus 10. Now, one thing that you should be aware of in Desmos is that the default mode is in radians, but I want that to be in degrees. That's easy enough to change, but make sure that you're, you're thinking about this. It's right here. Right now, angles are in radians. Now they're in degrees. All right. Now, my window is all sorts of off on this, so is my domain. A good domain is 0 to 3, and my window I've got this one all figured out already. Should go from negative five in the x direction to what did I want? Fifty. And from negative five to forty in the y. And there it is. There's my projectile path again. All right. Let me do this. Okay. And one more time, let me duplicate that thing. And everywhere there's a T, I'm going to put in an A. Just have to be careful. Add a slider. Go from 0 to 3. Maybe make it a different color. Go red. And let's watch that projectile. Excellent. Uh oh, <laughs> definitely it doesn't work that way. Let me uh, let me do this. There we go. What's great about this is we can see the path that the projectile is going to fly along. That's the green, and then we can actually see the motion. That's the red, and this is truly the motion. It kind of reminds me of um, the the game Angry Bird, especially the um, the more modern versions of it, where when you sort of adjust the projectile motion of the bird, you can see its path actually shown in a dashed line. All right, I'd like to do one more thing with the projectile motion. In projectile motion, the angle here, uh oh, and maybe I didn't want to get rid of all of that. The angle there is the initial angle. So 
we could ask ourselves, well, could we actually see the effect of all of this if we let that initial angle also get a slider? So maybe we keep that initial velocity at 40 feet per second, but we allow our initial angle to be different than 60. Let's take a look at how we can do that. We can actually adjust it right here, right now. All right, I'm going to, now I could call the angle anything I want, but I'm gonna call it theta. Here's my subscript button, sub i. Notice it already wants me to put in a slider. I will, I'll get to it. And then I'm gonna put in theta, sub i. I can put a slider in any time I want, but I'm gonna wait until I've got the theta i in here too. Theta, sub i. And theta subscript i. All right, let's add that slider. Now that slider is now the angle. So I think I'm going to let it be anything between 0 and 90. And now watch this. Right now that angle is at 0. Makes all the sense in the world. It's being fired off with an angle of 0. And now I can adjust that angle. Let me bring this back here. Right? And there's my projectile motion with an angle of 30 degrees. Again, remember that angle, and let me just pause this for a second, let me bring it actually to 30. That 30 degree angle, you can visualize as being the slope of that tangent line. I didn't look very good, or did that, but that's 30 degrees, that original slope. That didn't look very good, that's okay. We'll just erase it all. <laughs> But it's really a wonderful tool now, because now I can easily see, I can easily see the effect of that initial projectile angle on how far my projectile is going to travel. I can say, oh, okay, what was that? What's the sort of the classic angle? 45 degrees, right? Now I can really see, oh, yeah, at 45, you know, that thing is flying all the way almost to 60 feet. Right, before it hits the ground. On the other hand, a much more shallow angle, and I don't go quite as far, and a much higher angle, I also don't go quite as far. So I can really start to play around with equations from projectile motion in physics, which is kind of nice. All right. I'd like to remind students of one last thing, because I might have you do this in the future in terms of an assignment. If you want to share what you've created. All right, not the text up here. That's something special to this. Let me get rid of it. If I wanted to share this, right now I'm logged in. You can only share things if you have an account. Here I am, Kirk Weiler, eMath Instruction, etc. Right, if I want to actually share this with people, I might give it a title. I might call it Projectile Investigation. Sounds good to me. Now, if I want to share it with people, I can use this icon up here, right here. And if I click on that, here's my link. And what's really nice about this link, if I copy it, let me uh, open up another window in Safari, and I put that link in, it opens up my projectile motion. And the remarkable thing about this is that I can now play around with this without having it make any effect on this one. All right, so if I ask you to share something in the future, you got to have an account, but that's easy to do in Desmos. If you have an email, you can set up a Desmos account. That's all it takes. But you can then share a link with me in order to show me the work that you've created, which is really kind of cool. All right, let's stop there. That's quite enough. I just wanted to show students how to enter parametric equations into Desmos, how to change the domains of those parametric equations, as well as how to show the actual motion along the parametric equation by just plotting a point. So I hope my students got something out of this in terms of Desmos work, and I hope other students did as well. For now, let me just say goodbye. My name is Kirk Weiler, and as always, keep thinking and keep solving problems.